They are elected by you. I am elected by you. I'm constrained as they are constrained by a system that our founders put in place. The founders separated power because they knew it was the best way to protect our citizens. They didn't want one person, one man to have all the power like a king. We show by our work that free people can govern themselves. You can't pay lip service to the Constitution without obeying it. Keep your eye on the ball. Structure is uh, structure is destiny. This is Necessary and Proper, the podcast of the Federal Society's Article I Initiative. All views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Society. Hello, this is Nate Kazmarek. Thank you for listening to the Necessary and Proper podcast. For this episode, we have part two of our six-part series featuring panels and speeches from our March conference titled Restoring Article One," which was held at the U.S. Capitol. This recording features Oklahoma Senator James Langford and his remarks which discuss the current budget and authorization process and his proposed rules changes to post-cloture debate time for executive nominees. We hope you enjoy Senator Langford's remarks and welcome your feedback on this episode and all of our Article 1 programming at articli at fedsoc.org. My name is James Langford, Senator from Oklahoma, and today you can call me the late James Langford uh, because I'm running behind from a previous meeting that ends up happening at times, as some of you know very well. I want to give you a quick update on some budget reforms, and of all days, to be able to talk about reforming structure on budget. Let's talk about on the day that there's a giant omnibus hitting the desk of the Senate. How many of you remember the 1988 State of the Union address that President Reagan gave when he put a 43-pound bill on the desk and said, never again? We're doing another one this year, and we did one last year, and we did one the year before. Uh, now, there, I believe there were five of the six years after Reagan made that speech to basically try to humiliate Congress. I think five of the six years after that, there wasn't an omnibus. And then we went right back into the bad habits. Many of you may know the budget process was created in 1974 as a direct pushback on President Nixon from Congress and President Nixon having their own battles on, on funding and spending. So they created the 1974 Budget Act, and out of that 1974 Budget Act, we have things like CBO uh, that was created. We have multiple other entities, but we also have this 12-step process from 12 different appropriation bills. It also creates a budget committee, 12 uh, appropriation bills, but in between them are supposed to be authorization. So the way that it works, you write a budget, authorizing committees give input, appropriation committees all go through the process. The 12 of them pass individually. They get signed into law. That has happened four times in the last 44 years, as it was designed, four times. So what I've tried to raise the issue on is at some point we should stop just beating our head against this and saying next year we'll make it work because next year is not any different than this year. We need a change in the process of how we do budgeting. So it's not just a matter of how we do it. It's about where are we going. Each year, the debt and deficit gets larger and there's no attention to it. This year, there's additional spending, and I'm quite confident my Democratic colleagues are going to say we're going to have trillion-dollar deficits, and it's all because of the tax policy, ignoring the additional $300 billion that comes out of this omnibus, ignoring $120 billion in additional disaster aid, ignoring the additional $80 billion plus in interest rates as they rise, ignoring all those other aspects as well, and to see each of those stacked together are all stacking up on existing overspending that is scheduled every single year and continue to elevate the deficit because no one looks at the whole. Even when you actually get into the the appropriations process itself, there's no one that looks from committee to committee. We're spending $57 million in repairing the steps outside of the Library of Congress, but we're spending $10 million on interdicting drugs in Central America. Now, if you were to have $57 million, would you rather fix the steps in the Library of Congress or interdirect the the drug flow coming out of Central America? No one can look at it because those are two different aspects. Those are two different titles, and no one can look at one to the other and say, no, our priorities are more here than there. So how do you fix this? 
There is a 16-member team that has been put together, Republicans and Democrats, yes, another super committee, uh, that has been put together from House and the Senate with a responsibility to come up with a budget process. Whether we can get there, I can tell you that in November of this year. But the hope is to dramatically reform how we do budgeting. To not have a partisan process in budgeting, though there are plenty of partisan issues in budgeting, but to create a process that the process itself works regardless of whether it's a D or an R actually leading the House, the Senate, or the White House, to at least get a process to be able to hear things. You've got to have a big picture view. What are we actually trying to do? Is that debt to GDP? Is that trying to get to deficit reduction? What is the real goal of our budgeting? Is the goal of the budget to spend more or to actually try to be able to establish a process? Should we do the budgeting every single year? I don't think so. There are 20 states that do budgeting every two years. It provides some consistency of the process, that you have a crazy debate through one year, but at least you know for the next two, this is the process that's going to happen, and we're going to have some level of consistency in the process. CBO used to be about getting a score to Congress. CBO is now about trying to get the most arbitrary possible scoring back and to be able to find a loophole in the system. So we have wonderful terms here, things like pension smoothing, to be able to establish how do we get a balanced budget, or CHIMPs, changes in mandatory programs, to be able to say this money was intended for this, but we weren't spending it, but it was expected that we were spending it, and so it's actually a savings. And so we spend the same exact dollar year after year after year because it was allotted we would spend it, but we actually didn't, so that savings that we can spend somewhere else. Or overseas contingency operation funds, which tend to never go away beyond it. Disaster relief, which is really not budgeted, uh, but is above and beyond. And I can go on and on and on, on the exceptions to the rule. That's how we try to budget now. We've got to be able to fix through the process of that to be able to get a better product for it. So dealing with the CBO gimmicks, dealing with what we do, and the heresy of all heresies, what's the function of the budget committee now? The budget committee used to be all about doing the first step. The president's budget was supposed to be a submission that would come in of the ideas from all the executive branches, but the president's budget has never, ever become law. And it's actually just the whipping boy, typically. I have no issue with the president submitting here are ideas for duplication, here are ideas where we can have savings, here are ideas of things that we could do better or worse, but the president's budget becomes actually the political fighting point now rather than an established set of ideas. We need the ideas from the executive branch. They have them. They're operating through those systems. But we may not need something as expensive and as big and as complicated as something called the president's budget. There's a lot of money spent and a lot of time on a document that's put on a shelf. we got to fix that. Establish the budget committee, what their real role is and how they're going to operate, and try to figure out the, the most complicated of all of these. What's the alignment between the appropriations committees and the authorizing committees? Because for policy wonks in D.C. and folks that are around all the policy stuff like y'all are, y'all understand fully, completely the issue of that's a authorized but not appropriated, correct? That's an authorized program, but we're actually not doing it because it was never appropriated. Or the other side of that, no, we've appropriated that, but that's never been authorized. But go ahead and do it anyway, though it hasn't been authorized in decades because we have those two systems disjointed. At the same time, we've got to deal with small things like the debt ceiling that used to be used to actually limit our spending. Realize during the time of the Korean War, Congress didn't raise the debt ceiling. They found other ways to be able to balance out spending and such so they didn't have to raise the debt ceiling. That would be unheard of now. That used to be a feature that actually tried to limit spending and control our process. Now it's just another fiscal cliff. So what's the best way to actually get to our debt and deficit? Maybe that's some sort of pressure point that you can put on Congress to say the White House has the ability to be able to raise the debt ceiling if the deficits are actually going down. But if deficits are going up, we're heading the wrong direction and Congress needs to deal with it. Or maybe there's some other mechanism. But we've got to be able to figure out how to be able to resolve that. And we have to be able to get out of the endless loop of continuing resolutions. Your favorite cocktail party question could be asked someone, when's the last year we didn't have a continuing resolution in the federal spending? The correct answer would be 1995, that we didn't have a continuing resolution at all. We've got to get out of that loop. And it's not just because it's an annoyance in D.C., it's because every federal entity can't do contracting during that first quarter of every year because they don't have assured money.
And it's a problem. We lose a quarter of contracting every year now. And so things cost a lot more. It's part of the reason that we overspend on so many different items in the federal government. These are all areas that have to be addressed. They're all kind of inside the machine kind of issues that have to be dealt with. We're trying to be able to work through the process this year. And the hope is that we can actually come out with a resolution that actually works for us. Now, will it work for us for the next 200? No, it'll probably work for us the next 20 or 25, same as the 1974 Budget Act did. But we've got to be able to restart it. And we've got to admit this current system doesn't work. While we're at it, there are a few other small products that need to be resolved in the United States Senate. Things like post-closure debate time for nominations, which is completely irrational. The fact that we cannot get onto legislation because we've got post-closure debate time happening on a nomination that then passes unanimously, or that some district judge has to have 30 hours of debate time when actually no one ever goes to the floor and debates them, and then they pass unanimously, only to be able to stop the Senate from actually doing its work. We've got to be able to work through that process and try to figure out how do we actually get back to doing legislation again. These are not insurmountable issues. These are not even constitutional issues. These are process things. And I know you all enjoy getting a chance to be able to go through the machine. I thought I'd give you a little quick glimpse of some of the inside of what we're trying to be able to work through on budget process, some of the rules process that I can go into greater depth some other time when I'm actually on time. And then uh, maybe we can have some Q&A back and forth. Contact our team and if you have an interest to be able to talk about it. And I see some of our team members that are here even. Uh, but if you'd be interested to be able to connect with us or have insights or ideas on whether it be budget reform or Senate rules reform, share them. We don't think we own every good idea. Uh, and I'm not afraid to be able to pull ideas from all over the country. That's kind of what a representative republic is supposed to do, is to be able to pull ideas from all over the place. So let us know if we can stay engaged in some of those issues. And I appreciate your patience uh, today. And let me slip in a little bit late. Bless y'all. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Necessary and Proper. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell a friend. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. To learn more about the Article 1 initiative, please visit fedsoc.org slash article I. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash article I. This has been a FedSoc audio production.